Uh, yeah, so my name is John Phelan. My PhD is on dynamic spatial modeling and forecasting of sea life abundances. Um, so quite similar to the talk that Trondra gave earlier today. Um, my project is funded by Sustainable Aquaculture Innovation Center and the Data Lab. Um, yeah. So as I said, my project aims are to build a model that's capable of forecasting sea life abundances on Scottish salmon farms. Um, to achieve this, I'm um, using population models, um, combining those with particle tracking models, um, with the idea of bringing the two, um, the two models together to capture the entire life cycle of the, the salmon laws. So the particle tracking tools to take on the, the, the planktonic stages of Nauplii 1 and 2 and the copepodids, and a population model to, to describe those attached stages. Um, so just a little bit of information about um, the type of data that I'm dealing with. Um, first of all, to drive the particle tracking tool, we need a hydrodynamic model. Um, the one that I use is Westcoms. Uh, it's the west coast of Scotland um, based on FVCOM. Um, it's a 3D model with 11 variable depth layers and it's uh, based on an unstructured triangular mesh. This is really useful in this case to capture the complex coastlines of uh, Scotland. Um, with the hydrodynamic model, we can then use a particle tracking tool and we can change um, release locations, release times, the particle numbers, the particle weights, which are typically set as one and then decay, which then describes the mortality. Um, development rates, um, the depth of which we're releasing, um, coefficients of horizontal diffusion, and we also can define the radii around these farm sites. Um, with the particle tracking, we then use that to feed into the population model. Um, some of the important parameters that we can change here are attachment rates, uh, the development rate, um, again, mortality, the sex ratio, the observed counts are supplied to me by both Maui and Scottish Salmon Farm, SSF. Um, they also supply me fish counts, and I can take some larval outputs from primary literature to drive these models. Um, the particle tracking, first of all, um, is the, uh, the, the particles are advected by the hydrodynamics uh, from the oceanographic model. It, this gives the particles uh, velocity and diffusion. Um, the development time is based on degree days, so after 40 degree days, uh, the particles are considered infective. Um, this being that like, if, if the particle is in uh, 10 degree water for one day, it's accumulated 10 degree days. After two days, that will have been 20 degree days. Um, as I said, particles are released at the surface and are passive, so there's no swimming behavior currently in my model, which I think we heard earlier is not perfectly descriptive of what exactly is happening, but uh, I'll have to make do. And um, I can use these then to calculate the infection pressure for these farms. Um, on the right-hand side, you can just about make out uh, the, triangular, uh, the triangular mesh, which becomes far more concentrated once we move into the complex coastlines, and it's uh, a little bit more coarse in the open ocean. Um, so hopefully this will play. Ooh. I'll start it again. So... This is a release of 120 particles every single day, and this is the dispersal of the particles uh, from eight different sites around uh, Scotland. So up in the top, we have, um, up in the top right, just underneath Fort William, is uh, Loch Linney, and we're seeing an awful lot of particles being advected quite quickly out of the loch, uh, moving south uh, to southern Loch Linney, up through the Sound of Mull, um, and towards Loch Sunart, where the other farms on the, on the left-hand side are. Um, but also what we can see in that is that there's a huge amount of retention occurring inside in this lock here, over in Loch Sunart. Um, ah, yeah, uh, over here we see a, a lot of retention, as opposed to here where we see a, a lot of particles being advected uh, quite quickly away from the farm sites. Um, this is evident again in, the, uh, in, in uh, some connectivity matrices that I've had a look at. Uh, this connectivity matrix is for the entire of June 2019. And uh, there's two things that I'd like to highlight on this. Uh, first of all, the diagonal uh, describes uh, self-infection pressure. So uh, for some of the farms here, we see no self-infection pressure at all, and some we see uh, some relatively high uh, infection pressure coming from themselves. Uh, the two that I'd like to take uh, to point out is the box here in red, uh, Upper Loch Linney. 
um, is one of the management zones that is considered by the Scottish government. And uh, what I'm seeing within my particle tracking is no uh, connections between these sites and uh, no uh, self-infection. Uh, this is pretty unusual and I'm still not fully convinced exactly why I'm seeing this. It could simply be that the model isn't skilled enough or I'm not skilled enough to see exactly why that's happening. Um, but we are seeing some, some quite high uh, infection pressure for, uh, for, for some of these sites, such as this FS0012, which I believe is this black site here, which is, is quite far up the uh, Loch Sunart. Um, so using this information on a daily basis, as opposed to uh, the monthly aggregation that I've uh, presented, I can use that uh, as a feed into my population model, which I can describe um, next. Um, so there's a lot of different population models that, are, that, I, that I've had a look at. Um, the one that I will discuss today is a delay differential equation model, um, which Crawford has actually uh, uh, based it on uh, what Crawford has done and uh, included some other uh, pieces to it as well. Um, the dynamics are dependent on the temperature, the salinity, so temperature driving how quickly the, 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 the stages develop through. Um, salinity um, drives mortality. Um, growth parameters um, describe how quickly they move based on temperature. Um, the efficacy of the treatments as well is something that I've always been very interested in, seeing how, how the various treatments work on various stages of the lice. And uh, we also supply some um, egg production, which is typically 30 uh, larvae per day, is what we consider the adult females to be producing. Um, so where I started out with this was, was using um, uh, deviance as a model fit. So this is basically a ratio between the um, observed values and the predicted values um, to try and get an idea of how well uh, the, the uh, parameters from primary literature were fitting um, the data that I had. So with Maui supp supplying me with, um, with observed counts. Um, so over here on the right, we've, uh, I've given some um, average mortalities and uh, development stages for the uh, chalamus, pre-adults, adults, and gravids. Um, the one that I'd like to also draw attention to here is, is chalamus uh, 15. Um, I have not used um, deviance, or I have not deviated from what the, the, the literature has said with regards to the development time for that, which I'll explain in just a second. Um, so with data just from primary literature, not using any uh, model fit, this is the kind of fit that I get from the population model to the observed counts for a specific site. So we're seeing some relatively high um, uh, estimate, sorry, um, the, the points are my observed counts and the, uh, the green line here is, uh, is predicted in the model. Uh, so any, any dots are, uh, are, are observed on the sites. Um, so this here is for Chalamus, and we're seeing uh, counts that are, uh, uh, we're seeing that the model is over-predicting in this case, um, but it's under-predicting uh, for all other uh, stages of the, the louse that I'm considering. Um, but once I use um, deviance and have a, a bit of a tweak of the parameters for uh, growth and, uh, and uh, mortality, we see uh, somewhat better fit occurring. We're still seeing quite a large spike here, and this is, is due to the way that I have uh, supplied um, Chalamus to the, to the uh, model. What I've done for the Chalamus is, is use, this, uh, use the observed counts to, to drive the number of arrivals to the site. I've used 60%, uh, as far as I remember, of the, uh, the, of the Chalamus observed on the site as being new arrivals. Um, so we do get a, quite an overestimation, again, of Chalamus, um, so I'm less confident in, the, in these numbers, which is why I haven't used them to calculate the mortality or for the, uh, the, their development rates. But uh, I think the fit for, um, for pre-adults, um, adults, and gravids are uh, a little bit better, uh, of course, apart from the spike. Um, but what I would like as well to draw people's attention to is, is the, the actual observed counts themselves. And while I don't have um, y-axes on here, um, the scales are, are the same across all four plots. Um, so this section here, we're seeing quite low counts inside in here for, for Chalamus, the first stage. Um, but the pre-adults are uh, double um, what we're seeing with regards to Chalamus. Um, this doesn't um, make a huge amount of biological sense. Um, so what I am suggesting is that there is possibly a, a mis there is a mismatch uh, in the observed counts. So 
the model uh, over predicting the number of chalmers may not be as big a concern as I would have uh, presumed at the beginning. Um, but there is a question as to why this is occurring. Are, we, uh, are the counts just simply being missed on the sites, um, or are they being um, miscounted as, uh, as Caligus or something else? Um, so with the combined model, um, instead of using that source of Chalamus from the observed counts, I'm going to take the source of Chalamus from the uh, particle tracking outputs. Um, so for the next uh, little section, what I'm using for this uh, initial model fit is um, fish counts um, for s of 600,000. That's for all of the sites that I've released particles for, so that's eight sites across Loch Linney and Loch Sunard. And I'm saying that all of these farms have an average gravid lice per fish of 0.5, and I'm assuming that the attachment rate is 0 0.001. Um, and I also have a larval output of 30 larvae per day. Um, so this is the result of this model combination. Um, so not a fantastic match, but of course, it's not going to be a fantastic match when I'm using um, kind of initial parameters that aren't particularly realistic of what's actually occurring on these sites. But we are seeing uh, um, you know, an increase in population which drops off and then uh, starts to increase exponentially. And uh, we're seeing this uh, peak uh, being matched over here. This peak here is representative of what's happened over here uh, and so forth through the population structure. Um, the other thing then that I would like to have a, uh, a little discussion of today as well is the inclusion of um, treatments within uh, this. So the black vertical lines represent uh, treatments that have been applied on the site. So um, the observed counts should typically drop when a treatment has been applied. So I've also applied um, treatments to my uh, predicted, uh, or the, the estimation of the, the population, the model outputs. Um, if there is a treatment event, I assume that 95% of, of all stages are uh, removed from the, the population. And uh, we start to see um, a little bit more of a, uh, a little bit of a, a match between observed and estimated numbers, particularly for the adult females. We're seeing, I think, something that's uh, not particularly far off, although we're still um, we're, we're underestimating it a little bit here. Um, but I think in the future, once, I, once I've uh, changed and updated my model to include actual fish counts, actual observations of uh, lice within this, uh, we should start to see a little bit of a better match between these two things. Um, so a little bit of future work. I have four months left of my PhD, so I don't have a huge amount of time to do all of these things, but there are a couple of different things that I will include. Um, specifically, what I would like to um, include um, is some changes in the rates of development. There's some sensitivity analysis still to be done around the particle tracking, uh, which I'm a little bit concerned as to exactly what it is, but, but I have uh, limited time to, to, to delve into it too deeply. Um, swimming behaviors is something that I think I'm, I'm um, are important to include within the particle tracking. Um, as we've heard, uh, nauplii can descend down to, to different depths, and that will change where they actually end up, what trajectories they're going to take will depend, especially in these complex uh, lock systems. Uh, the movements could be completely different if we place them at different depths. Um, validation of the dispersal in, uh, model is also really um, important. I feel so the SPILD project is currently um, uh, underway at SAMS which is uh, collecting um, uh, planktonic stages in, uh, in Scottish lochs. So I think once the, that data has been analyzed, uh, it could be really useful in validating the particle tracking model. Um, so as I already said, the, the variable fish counts and lice counts is something that I will do before I finish off my PhD or try to submit it. Um, the treatment efficacy, um, currently I assume that if there is any treatment, it's 95%, but that's not true for the types of treatments that are being applied or, the, um, or the, for the different stages. So some variability in that would also be really nice. And uh, I currently model one single site at a time. Um, it would be nice to, to build that up into a, a larger network of sites so they can actually interact with each other. That might be a little bit over-optimistic of me to try and get to by the end of my PhD, but I might try. Um, yeah, um, that's it from me today. Thank you very much for your time, and I uh, look forward to your questions.